I am before Sorry. they turned me down. <laughs> you better go in here and speak. Who's speaking? Chris. Chris. It's oh, yes. Yeah. Where? At Kwana's side. Wayne. Oh, okay. John, John, thank you. Just get it. James, okay. no, I don't think so. I think you'll take it. <laughs> I'd like to call to order the Board of City Commissioners for May 19th, Shawnee, Oklahoma. Call a roll, please. Stevens. A.G. Here. Heron. Here. Maynard. Here. Paul. Here. Ringer. Here. Smith. Here. We have a quorum. Okay. If you're able, please stand. Our invocation will be led today by Reverend Jesse Hernandez. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not Ray Belford and, and Larry Sparks was supposed to stand in for him and Larry calls and was sick and asked me to stand in for him. So I'm standing for standing tonight. <laughs> Join me in prayer. Father, we just come to you and thank you for who you are. You are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Father, we just pray your blessing upon this meeting tonight. Father, we thank you for uh, this city that you've given us to live in and to serve in. And Father, for these, these folks that are on the commission, Father, we just uh, pray for them tonight, Father. Thank you for them and for their leadership. And Father, we just pray that in everything tonight, Father, may you get the, the glory and the honor. And Father, we just pray for your wisdom, Father. Everything that, uh, that comes about tonight, may it be led and, and guided by you. And Father, we'll be quick to give you all the glory and honor in it all. We ask your blessing, Father, in your precious name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, position, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> Item number one is consider approval of the agenda. So moved. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Harry. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. Good motion carries. Item number two is con consider approval of the consent agenda. Gentlemen and ladies, I would like to move item number H off of the consent agenda. And then we can have some discussion if there's some people here that would like to speak in this matter. I understand there are, so no problem with that. I think we approve that. Consent and tender was without item H. Removing item H. Second. I have a motion by Vice Mayor and a second by Commissioner Hall. Second. <laughs> Motion carries. Okay, let's go to item number H at this time, and it is approved community service contracts from the review committee recommendations from fiscal year 2014 and 2015. And I understand there are some people here from COTS, I believe, that would like to speak in this matter. So you have three minutes, a total of 12 minutes, if combination, if you would like three minutes each and please come forward and state your name and sign in and speak into that microphone so the TV audience can hear you. I'm Rebecca Stone, Executive Director at uh, Central Oklahoma Community Action Agency and thank you Mayor for consideration and letting sure. us speak. Um, we're here about our COTS contract. Uh, the city has uh, supported our COTS transportation program in the past and, uh, and we found out this year that uh, the city had issue with our audit. And um, we did not receive funding last year uh, for the same reason. But last year, uh, the problem was we didn't have an audit. It wasn't on time and, uh, and it overlapped with the period of getting this audit done. So there have been improvements. We now have finance staff on staff here in Shawnee. And, um, and I actually have addressed the management issues in our uh, current audit and would love to leave those for you as well. But um, we um, have been privileged to have the support of the, the city and have been able to provide rides in the city to uh, over 7,700 people in the past six months. And so 
we'd like to be able to continue that kind of service. And uh, the city's funding really um, serves as match for other funding for us because it shows that we have the community's support. And so I really would hope that you would uh, reconsider and, and uh, consider supporting us, if not at that full amount, which has been generous, but even uh, a partial funding uh, we would appreciate. Excuse me, did I hear you say that you came tonight with, do you have a list of what's been done? And you can give that to the city manager, I guess, right there, uh, toward your financial statement. Yes, this, okay. uh, this is a response to the management letter that was included in our audit this year, changes we've already made. And some of these were issues previously because of that op overlapping of when we got the last audit done and whenever this fiscal year ended. And so that's why some of those were still on there. Mm -hmm. But we've responded to that. We now have, like I said, uh, three people on our finance staff and are making changes. And I have my, uh, one of my uh, board members here who has extensive accounting experience who's also been coming weekly to help uh, support our efforts and, and start moving us forward. We've been trying to address issues from the past and are still tackling those and trying to move forward. And so um, we would just appreciate if you all would reconsider. Well, I, I serve on that committee, and I think so does Commissioner Herod. And, you know, we have been greatly concerned about your audit report, and that's been one of our major concerns. And I, I hopefully you're addressing all those issues. And I thank you so much for coming. Now, if you other ladies would like to speak or any commissioners would like to have questions of them, please feel free to do so. so well, I have a question. So is this just new information that we received right. today? Just got so. Uh, well, one thing, and Philip or Marianne can correct me, but we didn't get a, a new audit, I mean, a new copy of board members either. Some of the board members were listed on there are not even elected officials anymore, so I know they can't, are not serving on your board. So uh, we didn't get an up to date list of board members. Could you get that email to oh, definitely. our city manager, please, and yes. get an updated list? Sure. Huh? Anybody else have questions? If not, uh, the chair would like to make a motion that we uh, table this item huh? until the committee has a chance to review these new updates, if that's, if that's agreeable. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is that a, if that's agreeable, then we have a motion and a second. We'll vote on that matter. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The situation? Just the cops. Yeah. Just, just cops. Just the cops. Just that item. Okay. okay. <clears throat> that motion carries. Okay. You have something to say, Jane? Well, because this the commissioner's comments, I'd like to, with the cops people, I'd also like to know if their state contracts have been renewed and, and things like that, because that wasn't addressed either, was it, Phyllis? I don't think it was in the report. So that's one of the questions we had from last year was it, uh, has the state contract been renewed? And, and uh, with you now, or what's your situation on that? So if you could address that in an email or something. <clears throat> Come back up if you'd like. Come back, and that way people can hear you. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure who we correspond with, because I don't think we have good communication. Um, we didn't know that we weren't being reconsidered until the newspaper called me. And so okay. I didn't know there were things that were not, that you had questions about or that you still needed. And so I'm glad to respond to, to any of those now that well, I know them. members and that state contract was two of the things and the audit was the three things that actually was a red flag to us. Okay. And we have all those. Well, okay. we definitely That's need to fix the communication. Yes. So, who, do, who do I need to uh, ask those Brian, questions or respond to? I, I, I think <clears throat> Mr. McDougal. Okay. Would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we need to finish the rest of H. <laughs> okay. Uh, all I have is uh, approve. The, is there anything else under H that anybody would like to table, or we can just table that what portion? Huh? What else is under? Well, it's on, it's on your computer, I think. So you're gonna have to oh. yeah. We don't want to table the rest of it. Just that one. No, item. just that one item. Okay. Just you can approve the remaining. Okay. Chair will entertain a motion to approve well, the remaining. We've got a motion. Already, if we voted on that one. 
Did you table it? No, we haven't. Oh, oh. sorry. I, I thought we voted oh, to table. We did. We voted on that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No problem. And then it, and uh, we're going to take that back and review after they send all their stuff in. But on the remaining, that's not involving cots. The chair. I we adopt the, the other second uh, our committee report. Okay. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Harriet and a second by Commissioner Winery. <laughs> That motion carries, okay? Now down to commissioner comments. Any other comments from commissioners? Well, again, I'd like to remind everybody that Kickapoo is still open for business, <laughs> and uh, they're still working on it. There's a lot of congestion at MacArthur in Kickapoo. Oh, this there. last week was terrible. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd like to make a comment to the deal on the paper about the stamp bricks. Of course, I didn't like the red stamp bricks. I wanted them orange, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> But let's anyhow, move, move we on. didn't. I mean, <laughs> we need to listen concrete to work and stuff like that, and the highway and all that's a state contract. We didn't. Uh, city commissioners or the city engineer didn't have anything to do with the stamp concrete or the red brick or anything else. So, what was the city's? Could you just explain that, and we'll get that out of the way real quick. We were responsible for water and land. What? You know, roughly the approximately that project was ten million dollars. Our contribution was four. Most of our contribution goes into right of way purchase utility relocation and, and, and things such as that. Um, the design of the project, like Commissioner Harrod said, is an ODOT project. I was going to address that in my report, but I might as well address it now. You know, we've had some concerns, particularly with OBU and the graduations that they have out there. Um, they started on the intersection of MacArthur and Kickapoo Thursday last week, and that kind of sent a red flag up with all those events that are going on. But we worked it out with them because they, they're a good partner in what we're doing and that we wanted to let our contractor get out there. But Technically, it's not our project. We don't inspect it. We didn't design it. It's been we, we obviously got a chance to look it over. But you know, me personally, I'll just go ahead and tell you, commissioners. You know, the stamp concrete is a progressive type of of look. It makes the thing look better. There's not that much added cost. All it is is we color the concrete. Yeah. And it's a partnership between the city and, and ODOT. And I think it's I think it's um, a nice thing to to. Uh, it's it's not like it's brick or anything like that that's going to you know fail in the base. It's actual concrete just like the other is. So um, we're pleased to have that project and pleased to be able to partner up with ODOT on it. And once again, I, I, you know, I got a phone call about it. People complaining about not knowing the facts and think we're wasting the taxpayers' money. And it's not really us. It's the state. So. In fact, commissioners, um, OBU is relocating uh, Rayleigh Drive on MacArthur Street, and they're matching their intersection there with the stamp concrete at all. So it all, it all kind of pulls it together. Yep. Okay, anything else on our commissioner comments? Anybody I'd just like to say I attended the uh, groundbreaking out at OBU, and, and I'm just really, I mean, I've lived in this town, I was born here. <clears throat> and to see that school doing so many things all at once is just amazing to me because there for so many years they grew, you know, steadily. But they're just doing great. It's neat to see. Yes, sir. They, grew, they broke ground on three facilities. One was the nursing center. The other one was an expansion of their dormitories called the Village, and then lastly was a sports medicine clinic right next to the uh, athletic fields. All really great, great grand openings that are showing that the university is grow OBU is growing. I, I don't know the number, but you add up OBU, what they're doing, the millions of dollars they're spending. You add up the hospital, you add up the new mall, and you add up Kickapoo, and then we were so. Avitas was so gracious to give us a grant, a matching grant. That's going to be about another million dollars for sidewalks. That is, there is some great things happening in this city right now. Let me, let me clarify it, Mayor, because I want to make sure commissioners understand this. This grant that we're getting from the Avitas Foundation for, for is, is to help fulfill our master trails plan. Okay. You know, that's been on the books for a number of years, and it's been our, our plan to actually get that thing kicked off. So. It's really going to jumpstart that effort. That's correct. I understand, though, that it, one of the primary reasons why they approved that was because of the safe routes to school, uh -huh. right? The sidewalks mm -hmm. are going to tie in with the trails, mm -hmm. and they go past a couple of schools. Absolutely. That's sort of mm -hmm. thing. So, okay. That's great. Any other comments? Okay, if not, we'll move on to citizens' participation. Now, we do encourage citizens, if they want to tell us about something, uh, they're certainly welcome to come forward and uh, tell us about something. Mr. Crywicky, are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. He's 
gonna go take the bid. Okay, if not, then number five is a public hearing. Consider amending a planned unit development located at 3306 North Kickapoo. Applicant, J. Michael Adcock. We'll take a staff report at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Commission members. Case PO614 involves a request to uh, make a minor amendment to an existing planned unit development. Uh, specifically, the proposed changes would um, uh, make some modifications to the sign standards that are, that are uh, inherent uh, in that uh, development. They are relatively minor in scope and um, address some concerns that, um, uh, that existing uh, businesses <coughs> plus potential future businesses um, have as a result of, of how that was, uh, was uh, originally awarded. Uh, back in, I think, 2006 or 2007. Um, and so this um, case was heard before the Planning Commission on May 7th and was unanimously recommended uh, for approval, uh, subject to the four conditions uh, that are included in your packet. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, regarding this request. Okay. Thank you. I guess there are no questions. Is it, excuse me, to save you from coming back up again, is it your recommendation? Yes, sir. Okay, I know we have an order for that since you're here. Just go ahead and ask for your recommendation Thank you. on that matter. Okay, at this time, I'll open the public hearing in this matter. Uh, to call for those. Anyone here like to speak in favor of this? Okay, no one coming forward in that matter. Would anyone like to come forward and speak opposed to this matter? not I will close our public hearing we've heard your staff recommendation how about discussion ladies and gentlemen it looked like the Planning Commission was unanimous approval okay okay the chair will entertain a motion in this matter then so I move with the second with the stipulations, stipulations that, yeah. that are in there we have a motion by Vice Mayor Herrick and Commissioner Smith James, you gonna vote? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> John, you gonna vote? I did, but yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, be okay. With me. Thank you. Okay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Item number six is a public hearing in consideration of an approval of an ordinance to rezone property located in North Bryan from A1 Agriculture to R3 Multifamily Residential. We'll take a staff report in that matter. Thank you. I know there's a lot of information in your packets tonight, so if you're trying to follow along, this is on page 102 of your electronic packet. Uh, this request would rezone approximately five acres from A1 Agricultural to R3 uh, Multifamily Residential. Uh, the applicant is Mr. Mike Lanley. This request was also heard before the Planning Commission on May 7th. It um, carried with a vote of 6-0 um, of with one abstention. Um, staff does recommend, excuse me, staff does recommend approval of the uh, rezone request and finds that the um, request is appropriate given the surrounding site conditions uh, as well as the comprehensive plan. There are not a lot of details known at this time um, regarding specific uh, uh, development uh, proposals. Uh, Mr. Langley did include uh, um, some rough draft uh, conceptual uh, drawings, but I don't want you to, to, to think that that's um, kind of a final design. There's um, <clears throat> some more work that's needed, and this property will also have to be platted. And of course, we'll need full engineering designs on it, and, and there'll be some public utility extensions as well. So the, the project um, in totality you will see again at some point in the, in the future when those additional details uh, are known. Do you have a recommendation? In that yes, matter? sir. Staff does concur with the Planning Commission recommendation and, and does recommend approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, any questions? For the staff? Okay. No? Thank you. Okay. At this time, I will open the public hearing in this matter. Uh, would, if anyone likes to speak in favor of this matter, they're welcome to come forward. No one coming forward. Then anyone opposed to this matter, please come forward. Okay, sir. No, no, we have, a man. we have someone coming forward. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I didn't say I'm sorry. Sir, please state your name and sign in there real loud into that microphone. My name is Albert Rice, and I, my property is 2300 North Bryan, just across the street from where the uh, alleged uh, apartments will be built. My concern is the large volume of traffic that will be coming in, and there's Grove School there. We have grandkids who will be playing in and out of there. My main concern is the uh, large volume of traffic uh, that, that this uh, new development will bring in to that particular location. My property is right uh, across the street from where the apartments will be. Uh, the apartments will be, be on the corner of Bryan and at the gate of Granada. So uh, I have some problems with that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, help me out with the directions on this. Brian, right across from Ganada, that's four lane there, right? So how many units are we talking about? Well, he says his plans are sketchy. So oh, you know. I mean, Mr. Langley is in the audience, so you may want to address those specifics okay. to him. But let me, you can answer this for me. That's where it's four lane, Brian, right? Yes, sir. This, that portion that's of, four lane, uh, of right Brian is, is four lane. There okay. was, and, I uh, thought maybe if it was north, you know, it narrows down mm -hmm. to two lane, but when I have trouble looking. Will yeah. There, will there be another entryway? Re yeah. Regarding uh, access points, um, that was mentioned at the at the planning commission. Some of the conceptual drawings show one or more uh, driveways also on Granada, mm -hmm. and that, there was some concern there about trying to limit um, uh, access to the uh, uh, lower density residential street, and so um, that was discussed. Um, we, although we don't have a final design, it was indicated that probably be preferential for the access point to be fr from Bryan Street uh, as opposed to Granada. And so we'll, and we'll have to look at the overall circulation and, and look at... Um, but traffic uh, will be considered in you as you're looking at that, right? It Always will. Always do. Always do, right. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, commissioners? Say you don't. I understood it's going to be in the original <coughs> first phase. It's going to be about 30 units, 35 units. <coughs> Okay. Chair will entertain a motion in this matter. Motion to approve. Oh, I didn't. Time out. Didn't close the public hearing. I messed up there. Sorry. We have a staff recommendation. We've already had our discussion now. We have a motion to approve by motion Commissioner Winteringer. Do we have a second? I second. Second by Vice Mayor Hare. Would you read the title, please, ma'am? This is an ordinance concerning the zoning classification of property located within the corporate limits of the City of Shawnee, Pottawatomie County, Oklahoma, located in Section 9, Township 10 North, Range 4 East of the Indian Meridian, from A1, Rural Agricultural, to R3, Multifamily Residential, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Shawnee accordingly. Okay. Let's vote. Motion carries. Item number seven, a public hearing and consideration of approving an ordinance with a conditional use permit for property located at 909 East Independence from R3 Multifamily Residential District to C1 Neighborhood Commercial with a conditional use permit. Staff report at this time, please, sir. Thank you again. This um, recommendation is on page 122 of your packet. Uh, this request involves uh, the rezone of property presently zoned for R3 multifamily residential at 909 East Independence to uh, C1 commercial with a conditional use permit to allow for uh, mini storage um, for mini storage facility to be to be constructed there. Staff has recommended uh, approval of both um, both the rezone and the conditional use permit. There was um, quite a bit of discussion at the Planning Commission, and that ultimately led to two separate motions at the Planning Commission. One motion for 
uh, rezoning the property from R3 to C1 commercial, which passed unanimously 7-0. And then a second uh, motion to approve a conditional use permit uh, for the mini storage. And that passed 6-1. to one. So on your packet tonight is, a, is, is the com combination of those together, which ha happens also to be what staff is recommending, which, which would approve uh, the rezone with the conditional use permit. Hopefully that makes sense. There was uh, two conditions that were uh, recommended uh, and are included in your packet, and so uh, I do recommend that those be uh, adopted if you if you choose to accept the uh, recommendation from the Planning Commission. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm looking at this map again, and it just doesn't show me exactly. It's across the street from the bank next door to yeah. O.N. Gear, next door to the smoke shop. Smoke shop down there. Okay. okay. Next door to the... Okay. On the That's south side. It's uh, nine on there. Yes, sir. Okay. How much landscaping has got to be there? Or how do you judge that? The 1.9 acres. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a 1.9 acre site and, and uh, flowers uh, monthly monthly flowers. <laughs> we don't have any requirements <laughs> such as that. Uh, the, the concerns that were expressed from the uh, planning commission regarding design were related to uh, uh, fencing and. Um, and um, so there is some specifications on there so that the fencing style would be attractive, particularly along Independent Street. And there's more flexibility on the other um, sides. And then um, some additional landscaping between, between the fence and that sidewalk area there on Independence just to kind of help soften. Now, storage units are metal units. Storage units are metal, but you now, can- They have facing the street have to be bricked? Yes, yes, in like accordance with the new agreed. ordinance. Okay. And if you, if you can picture okay. that, um, storage facility on Bryan Street that was put in about two years ago that has the same thing it has a brick facade on the okay. on the very front of those even though we didn't have that requirement at the time okay, okay. any other questions thank hey, you sir I didn't hear your recommendation recommendation is for approval with conditions okay approval with conditions okay it's got to be painted red yeah. Not orange. Hey, hey. Can we paint it orange? So one side's going to be red, one side's going to be orange. Okay, <laughs> at this time I'll open our public hearing in this matter. I'll call for those in favor to come forward and speak. No one coming forward. I'll call for those opposed to come forward and speak. No one coming forward. Then I'll close this period. Public hearing, uh, we have a staff recommendation. Is there any other further discussion, ladies and gentlemen? If not, colors. If, not uh, if not, then I'll call for a motion in this matter. I'll make a motion to approve the conditional, or to approve the rezoning with conditional use permit. Commissioner Agee made the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Winteringer, okay. Would you read the title, please, ma'am? This is an ordinance concerning the zoning classification of property located within the corporate limits of the city of Shawnee, Oklahoma, being the east 211.825 feet of the north half of lot 4 and the west 63.175 feet of the north half of lot 3, McDivitt's addition to the city of Shawnee, Pottawatomie County, Oklahoma, according to the recorded plat thereof from R3 multifamily residential to C1P neighborhood commercial with conditional use permit and amending the official zoning map of the city of Shawnee accordingly. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Commissioner AG, did, was that with conditions? Yeah. With the conditional use okay. permit. Uh, with okay. conditions. Okay. She said that, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, let's vote, ladies and gentlemen. Motion carries. Okay, item number eight. Consideration of approval of a preliminary plat for Panda Express located at 194 Shawnee Mall Drive. How about a staff report, Mr. Erickson? Thank you. This report will cover agenda items number eight and number nine, which are the preliminary and final plat. And the staff report in your, in your packet on page 138 is a combined staff report. So I just wanted to point that out uh, initially here. Uh, this request involves the approval of a preliminary and final plat, which would facilitate uh, the development of a small restaurant pad site uh, in the um, Shawnee Walmart parking lot, essentially, at 194 uh, Shawnee Mall Drive. This would be located um, 
north of Mall Drive, just um, just west of the Murphy uh, uh, fueling station, um, there in, in an area that's that's generally unoccupied by um, by motor vehicles. Um, at, at, at present, it's already fully paved and fully developed, but just uh, underutilized. And uh, the um, the proposal is to uh, site a, a Panda Express uh, restaurant there. Uh, we do have the building plans uh, that have been submitted as well, so I, I know that they intend to, to begin construction soon. So this is an, uh, yet another of kind of several uh, national restaurant chains that are that are finding their way to Shawnee. So uh, very good from that standpoint. The Planning Commission uh, reviewed the preliminary and final plat request, case 0514 and 0614, and unanimously recommended approval. Uh, staff recommends approval as well, subject to the three conditions. We have is to there, answer is there any questions. Drive through on that. Yes, sir. There will be a drive through on that. When I pull up there, it's really it's it's confusing who's going where because you've got the frontage and then you come out of Walmart. Is that going to help that or hurt that or what's your? I would say that uh, in some respect, this could this could help in that it will um, no longer be a uh, full, kind of a thoroughfare for for Walmart. So it would be kind of an established site in and of itself, and people that will be there will not be probably traversing through the restaurant parking lot to get to Walmart. Um, so I think it, it would help. I, I, there are, were some, this is obviously a congested area. It's a, it's a popular area. That's why they want to be here to begin with. But, but, uh, but with that comes uh, you know, traffic concerns. There was, um, there was a traffic study that was done in this location several years ago when the Shawnee Mall proposed some out parcel development as well. And their proposal was some uh, more extensive development with, uh, I believe, two restaurant sites and a hotel site, and then a new uh, theater complex in the back. And so we have established some of those triggers when, when, when a traffic signal will be required at, this, at, the, at that intersection. Um, and so we know that one's not required at this time with this restaurant. But, but down the road, I think, I think certainly um, in the not too distant future, I could see another traffic signal at that, at that intersection. Which, which when the second one? Yeah. Yes, sir. The second one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never know to go or to stop or who's stopping there. It's pretty dangerous right now yeah. as yeah. it is. And the and go back to the traffic light. Then. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, all, I'm not over that direction. That's bad too. <laughs> That's as bad as <laughs> That's as bad over there, too, Wes. Well, let me just share this with you. I went to Houston this weekend. Nothing's bad. <laughs> <laughs> just go down there and you'll say, this is a great place. Uh, uh, okay, can, I, we can I ask a, a kind of related but off the subject question? Uh, there's a stop sign at the railroad at 45th, just east of Central Disposal. Hmm. You stop for that. But you don't stop the one just, just east of the property we're talking about tonight. Is mm -hmm. there a reason why you can just go through that stop sign, but we have to stop at that one or 40 feet? I, I know there's a reason. I don't know why. Does it? Um, did we have an arm there? Mm -mm, we no. don't have an arm at either one of those. No, okay. it's got a stop sign, and, and yeah. I, it just dawned on me today, and right. I've been on here a long time. But I mean, you don't. You just keep yeah. on going, and I'm thinking, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I really don't know. I don't know if perhaps Mr. Crywicky knows or not, but uh, but that I, I, that's been. Say he's got flashing lights. So I'm seeing someone mm -hmm. in the audience tell us. Uh, Mall Drive has flashed. They're burning out. The they're burning out. I don't think they're working. Was there a train there when you were there? No, no, I'm yes, okay. Oh, <laughs> they only come on when the train's there. Yeah. Oh, you, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not the enemies general. right now. Let's be united here. What's the deal? <laughs> How about further discussion? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. That. Okay, we, uh, we have, he has spoken on both matters, but we need to vote on both. The first one was preliminary plat, which we have to vote on, so I'll chair will entertain a motion in that matter. Okay, we have a motion by- Second. By Mr. Mayor here, the second by Commissioner Hall. Let's vote on that matter. I don't know what a Panda Express is. Oh, it's a Chinese to-go restaurant, kids love it. Oh, I like it pretty good myself. Motion carries. Item number nine, which we've already had a staff report on, which is the final plat, since there's wanting to get on with this construction. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Harry. I have a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Hall. Let's vote. Hang on.
Motion carries. Item number 10 is presentation consideration in a public hearing on revisions to the City of the Shawnee Zoning Codes. Applicant, City of Shawnee. We'll take a staff report in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Give us a short version. I'm going to give you a, a, a short version. I know it's an important night. Uh, so I'll give you the, the um, summary version. Um, and this item starts on your packet on page uh, 152. And then it's about 102 pages after that. Um, but in, in summary, and I want to start off by asking, by, by, by um, specifying exactly um, what I'm asking for tonight under agenda item number 10. I'm not asking for you to make a, a, uh, a decision uh, tonight or vote on anything specific. Uh, there is no ordinance with this. And that was done intentionally so that you'd have a chance to digest a 100-page document and ask any questions tonight or at the next meeting or in between the two meetings. And, and so that you feel comfortable um, about it before we, uh, before it's adopted, um, this process started over over two years ago, and the planning commission uh, and staff have been working diligently um, since then to uh, to strive to update the city zoning code. The current zoning code dates from about 1989, and it was subsequently updated in piecemeal fashion by a, a, num a number of ordinances after that. And it's cumbersome and, and difficult to use. And I think everyone recognized that it needed, it needed um, update. And there was efforts previously that were started and stopped and updates back in 2006 when a consultant was hired in 2007 that, um, that ended without a new code. And so we wanted to be slow and meth methodical as we spent the last two years uh, working towards where we have now. Uh, I also wanted to specifically thank three planning commission members who, whose terms expire in, in, in June, and they've been with us um, the whole time through this process, and and, work, and have also served two full terms, and that's the uh, uh, Chairman Shauna Turner, uh, Brad Carter, and Kirk Hoster. I wanted to mention those those individuals uh, specifically uh, for the record. Uh, also wanted to mention Justin De Bruin, who's who's in the audience, and he's the assistant city planner, and he's been. Uh, spending a lot of uh, his, almost all of his uh, staff time uh, on this since, since he's been here for the last eight or nine uh, months uh, as, as well. So included in your digital packet was a staff memorandum that summarized the process and also highlighted some of the key changes. And I, I just wanted to go over those brief, briefly in case you had not had a chance to, uh, to review that. But the biggest change between the current code and the new code is its formatting and its readability. And we've gone from an existing code that's 200 plus pages to one that's half that size. And we've done that through good planning practices, but also through the use of tables and graphs and, and combining things that were uh, repetitive in the, in the current version. And so as a result, we were able to end up with a code that's, that's better and more detailed and yet uh, less uh, length, uh, which, is, which is good for all those that use it on a, on a regular basis. And one of the consistent complaints that I've received since, since I've been here from developers and from, and from the development community engineers and such is that it's difficult to navigate the code and, and there's hurdles that we have in place that maybe they don't have in place in other jurisdictions. And so we, we reviewed this and, and proposed changes uh, in accordance with that, with that thought. There are several key things that we did is state law has changed a lot since 1989. And in many places, we were not consistent with state law. And so the new zoning code has been updated to ensure that it's consistent throughout from, from, from specific definitions to state licensure requirements uh, to notice requirements, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's been allowances. We've completely lo we've looked at the residential zoning districts and made sure that we have appropriate um, standards in place for density and for setbacks. Um, we've met individually with um, the large uh, home builders and, and, and developers in the community. Uh, we held an open house uh, in April uh, as well. So there's been uh, the opportunity and discussion um, with a wide variety of stakeholders uh, in the community regarding this too. And I think... Um, I mean, to speak for anyone, but I believe that, that, that all have been generally very pleased and very 
uh, very happy with, uh, with the result. We included specific standards for boarding and rooming houses or homeless shelters, um, which was specifically requested um, about a year and a half ago when the moratorium was put in place. So those have been incorporated into, the, into this code. Uh, we've updated uh, child care uses and des designations to be consistent with state law. We've looked at landscaping standards, looked at what we require for large commercial sites and, 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 and uh, how those um, how those large commercial sites need to be designed even better when it comes to landscaping, when it comes to building design and, and facades. We looked at the facade ordinance that was passed and we incorporated that into the new zoning code. And one of the things that the ordinance that you adopted did is it, it set standards for commercial zones, but it didn't set standards for non-residential uses in residential zones. So for instance, in a commercial zone, you could put up a large church and that would require a facade treatment. But if you put that same church in a residential zone, it didn't require um, facade treatment. And so we've, we've corrected that in this new version. Um, and so we were able to look at everything with just greater detail. We also looked at where we were in, in, in light of, of, um, of other communities. And this is a good time to go through this process too. The uh, city of Oklahoma City and the city of Midwest City um, just went through a, a similar process. So we were able to kind of learn from, from, from their processes as well. Um, we looked at our, at our um, alcohol laws as well and how it reflects in, in, in what restaurants and, and, and businesses can, can come to Shawnee and, and kind of what, what hurdles they have to jump through. And we made some, some key changes uh, there as well. Um, restaurants that are, that are restaurants primarily, like a, like a Red Lobster, like a Chili's, for example, um, if they, if they want to serve um, alcohol as a kind of a side part of what they do, then that no longer requires a conditional use permit because they're primarily a, a, bar, a, a restaurant and not a bar, not a nightclub. And so that's a, that's a key change that, that is consistent with, with what other communities have done. And, and it's one more step, I think, um, an important step to modernize um, and, and be attractive to, um, to new retailers and, and, and uh, commercial uses uh, to the community. I do want to specify, though, that, uh, that bars and nightclubs and liquor stores continue to require a conditional use permit, uh, which requires a public hearing and notification. So we've, we still have that requirement um, uh, in place. Uh, sometimes when communities um, update their zoning code, they also update their zoning map. And we're not proposing that at this time. And so we are, no individual property owner is going to have a new zoning designation because of this, of this uh, if you were to approve it. I wanted to specify that as well. Sometimes that is a concern. That's kind of a quick summary. Um, I'm a little bit confused. You yes, said sir. that you didn't want action taken on this until June 1st, right? Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, what we wanted to do was um, introduce it to you tonight, <clears throat> answer any questions you have right now, allow you to have a couple more weeks to digest it and ask any questions, call me, email me, or, or ask them at the next meeting. And we'll prepare an ordinance um, for, the, for June 2nd, which will be available for, uh, for you to adopt. Justin, going through this. Yes, sir. Was preparing it and having, holding the meetings or anything, was there anything that was controversial? Any of the cha proposed changes? I think that um, some of the things we discussed that, that much of what we discussed that could be controversial, I think we, had, we chose to address it uh, through, through, um, through other means, such as design standards. So for example, um, when we looked at the use table, what was allowed in each zoning district, I think it's, it was, imp we had to remind ourselves that you know, yes, this may be allowed, and maybe it's objectionable because it's typically built out of metal, but now we have this facade ordinance and it's gonna blend in better, so this would be appropriate in the commercial zone. So there are ways to, uh, to mitigate it. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the issue of density always comes up, and what's, what's an appropriate density? Um, I, I think general consensus is, is that the, the R1 zoning standard, which is the single family residential standard, which is, where most people in Shawnee live and where probably our most, it is our most prevalent zoning district that and, and, and agricultural actually, um, that that um, 
has been working fine at a 6,000 square foot requirement. Most lots are even bigger than that. And so we, we retained that uh, allowance. We did, um, we did look at some flexibility though for those R1 lots that are in older neighborhoods where you have maybe a more compact lot or maybe you are serviced from an alley in the, in the, um, in the back of the lot and, and where there's other considerations. So there's some additional flexibility for lots kind of in historic neighborhoods, if you will. And, and then we looked at the R2 and the R3 zoning districts, R3 being high density and R2 being medium density, where today that was always, R2 was always considered two family. So the two meant two families. So the most density you could do would be basically a, a duplex. And so now in the R2 zone, it's more of a true medium density district where you can do, um, you can do a triplex if it's multifamily and, and then if it's, um, if it's set up more like townhouse style, you could actually have uh, even greater density than, uh, than that. So um, we also, in talking with uh, developers and, and um, a couple of our local engineers realized that it's been kind of neat to see the last, but the last couple of years, we've been growing a lot from, from kind of the core of town where there's been some infill projects and, and, and people developing on, on smaller lots. And we realized that um, our standards for a planned unit development that would allow flexibility and kind of a unique concept had a one acre minimum lot size. And so it was suggested that we re remove that, eliminate that, that minimum size requirement to open it up, open it up to, to additional sites. So we, we, we did do that as well in this, in this um, proposal. Um, you also have a former builder on the planning commission now, and I'm sure, I'm sure that he's knowing him. He's probably had, had input on this, and he's still friends with the other home. <laughs> so yeah, I'm yeah. sure he's passed that along to him. He has, and for, and for your typical um, residential home, there's not a lot new in here that's going, this is really going to, where the community is going to see the greatest impact is going to be on, on commercial sites and on, um, on larger multifamily uh, type developments, so. Um. Okay, we have a staff one here. One thing that I want to point out is kind of an email or a news article going around that there would never be a, any ordinance or codes on the homeless shelter. And, um, as uh, Justin already pointed out, that's one of them that's in there, so. Mm -hmm. I went through that myself and read every word of it uh, Sunday afternoon, so I was pleased with that part of it and was pleased that it was in there. I think the planning commission and the staff done a great job of uh, uh, working on the code and getting it narrowed down and trying to get uh, under control. I think it's done a great job. I think before those commissioners go off, I mean those uh, planning people, we need to bring them in here and give a little rec. That's a tough working, hard working group of people right. in that and they, do, they have a real major input into our city and its future 50 years down the road. So let's keep that in mind. Are they come out? Yeah. Some of them are. Yeah. Would you say three? Yeah, three. three. Mm -hmm. three I'll three have one. some recommendations for you within the next few days. We agree with one of the there's been two others. I think there's about five came up at the same time. We really wanted to. I believe so. It was either four or five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess since this is a public hearing, we need to open it up, I guess, to see if anybody would like to comment to that. I'll open the public hearing. Would anybody like to give input in this matter? Four? All right. Anybody like to come up against it? Okay. No one opposed. And I will close the public hearing. We've already heard the staff re recommendations. I don't know if there's a vote in this matter. Okay. All I'm today, just saying. No, sir. We just are going to move on with that discussion and, and all that. So we will just move on. Item number 11 is considered granting an excess easement of 0.21 acres in size through city owned land located along Archery Range Road to Gary Chatham. Justin, it's your night tonight. Justin. You're already here. Back. What page is that on? I think this is the last uh, thing I've got on this. 261. Wow. 261. So what you said. Kind of depends on where you consider the first page. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll go back and read those hundred pages. On that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a speed reader. In detail. I mean, uh, take speed a read. On his coach. I read part of it. We, we did. We wanted to provide you hard copies. So. Yeah. 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 I sat down Sunday afternoon, turned off the golf, and didn't watch car races or anything. I sat down Ooh, and I'm impressed. That 
It's, it was kind of nice not having a the Thunder game where the weekend you could. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I like to give it up the Thunder game for it, but I had to give up the golf game for it. Okay. Justin, you're on about Thank you, sir. Agenda item, item, item number 11 involves a request from a citizen of Shawnee named Gary Chatham that is requesting an easement through city owned property uh, out uh, in the Shawnee Twin Lakes area to be able to facilitate uh, additional access to his property. Staff report is uh, in your packets on 257. And staff is recommending uh, granting of the requested easement. The um, Probably the most informative thing to you will be page two of the memorandum that provides a figure that shows the extent of the property. It's a large property. It's 70 acres in size. There is, a there is one residence on the property that provi is provided access from Highway 102. And so this access is off of Archery Range Road and would provide access to the, to the back portions of the property. Is that 102 that's? Oh, is that, I guess it is. Yes, yeah, on the right hand side there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And it looks like we already have some some access roads off that anyway to some other. We do, sir. Um, immediately to the um, um, south of, of, of that property, there is another uh, similar situation where there's two or, two or three access yeah. points, and, and they're all recorded easements um, that were granted from the city of Shawnee in the 1980s for that. So this how is. Wide? This is how wide is that? Uh, with like 20, 30 feet. Yeah, he's requesting. Uh, it's 40. 40. And uh, as requested, he, uh, Mr. Chatham, did provide a uh, appraisal. It showed the value to be $400. And in, so staff would recommend. Is he going to build the road on that? There would be no cost incurred to the city. So if so it, he'll maintain it. He would maintain it. It would be private. If he was ever to to develop that property. Um, and there was access to the properties, then it would need it would need to be you know, done in accordance with with city code. And uh, he has not, Mr. Chatham has not indicated any immediate plans to to develop the property, um, but certainly this easement would would facilitate that in the future. Is this to make a road off Archer Range to that nine acres uh, that didn't have access yeah. from Archer Range? That it would. It would not provide access. No, all of this, I want to make sure I understand your question correctly. All the 70 acres is owned by Mr. Chatham, oh. and it's one parcel. So, it, so if you're referring to another nine acre parcel okay. that's owned that's by another individual, it's not. Okay. No, ma'am. Is this on the section line? Section line? Let me double like check. Two. Is it? Okay. It is. It's a blind section. I have to double check on the legal. I don't believe it is, sir. Yeah. <coughs> is it? Did I hear a recommendation from S you? Staff does recommend a, a granting of the easement um, okay. subject to payment of the $400. Okay. Thank you. We've heard a staff report and we've had questions too. The chair will entertain a motion in this matter. Am I going to make a motion? I'll make a motion. A motion to approve. Second. <laughs> okay. We have a second by Commissioner Hall. Okay. So oh, they make the motion. I made the motion. Oh, well, I made it. Okay. It's awful quiet up here for a <laughs> Okay, let's Steve. vote. We're waiting on Steve. Uh, motion carries. Item number 12, uh, I, I'm not going to really get, I'd like to have this item moved, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I, what, I don't want to request it's on there, but then yeah. late this afternoon some other stuff came up, so. I'd request that we put it off a couple of meetings till we can. Till like June, the next, the first meeting in June, and no, maybe second uh, meeting in June. The second meeting in June, if somebody. That way, I can ask the city attorney to check into it, and then I can talk to her about it. So the economic the development people, and yeah. see if their insurance could cover this or whatever it is. We okay. have some questions in that matter. Okay. Uh, we just need a motion of that effect, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Oh, yeah. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to table this item for till June what? Second Phil meeting in June. Second. Second. Just say meeting. second meeting in June. Yeah, second meeting in June. Okay. We have a motion to move this item to the second. second. Meeting. Have a second by Commissioner Hall. Let's vote. I apologize that that didn't come up till the last minute. I'm sorry. Sorry. 
Motion carries, okay. Item number 13, discussion consideration mm -hmm. and possible action on acceptance of proposal for parks master plan by Schaefer, Klein, and Warren. Mr. Bryce. Mayor and commissioners. Uh, there were two uh, submittals returned uh, on our request and uh, staff has went through those two calling references and, and has chosen um, Schaefer, Klein, and Warren to, uh, to, to negotiate a contract with. Uh, and we negotiated <clears throat> the contract to be $29,600 with uh, uh, reimbursable expenses at, at $1,800, which brings the total to $31,400. Um, we do have 25000 budgeted for this, and I do have another account uh, that's there for some park upgrades that, that uh, can be transferred over to, to cover some of those costs. What? Will it all be done in one fiscal year? It will about? all be done in one fiscal year. Well, I want to tell you it will be. I don't like giving out estimates of time anymore because I've <laughs> <laughs> been through the pool. Huh? Uh, you know, uh, I feel six months could, could probably uh, complete this. Uh, there, there's, there's quite a bit of detail in some of the work that they're doing. Uh, staff feels that, that there's a very valuable information to come out of this as to, to what our citizens think about the parks, how, they're, how they want to use them, how they are using them. Uh, what's the trends uh, that that are coming around uh, you know as time goes by things change and, and we need to change uh, some of the stuff that we, we provide some of our citizens and some of the activities uh, it will also help give us a, a guideline on replacement of equipment um, looking at ADA issues uh, we've needed to have an ADA transition plan for quite a while for our parks you know, to make sure that, that every area of the parks are accessible. Do they measure utilization of parks? There's a couple of parks I go by that looks like I've never seen anyone in. Well, and that's, that's some of what the survey is about, uh, okay. surveying the citizens kind of in that area that, one, why are they not using a park or what could we put in there that maybe that, that community could utilize that park, so. Is that land that the city bought for the regional park over off West Tech, is, is that considered a park that will be looked at in this study? Uh, it was bought for park land, and yes, we'll, we'll have it part of it. Okay. Uh, but, but staff is recommending to award the, the contract. So you think this is going to help with this on maybe additional Adidas Springs or some green like that? It's very possible, yes. So we'll have a better chance of getting grants if we have this. And, and what, what some of this other information within this is going to do is help justify why we want to, to either purchase equipment or do something. We're going to have uh, statistical information behind that backing it. So, uh, how, old was the old, how old was the old master plan? We never had one. Oh, we, okay. had a, we had kind of a master plan <coughs> years back uh, oh, okay. that somebody that, done about the lake. The trails plan. Sorry, well, we, we have a master trail plan, too. Lake, yes. though, it wasn't anywhere else, the golf course at the lake, I think, yeah, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just so I'd include those parks out there, too. It will include those parks, too, yeah. Okay. How is this survey done? Is that, is that mailed out? Do you know? I, I noticed where they said they're going to survey the citizens. It's, it's explained uh, uh, a few different ways in here. Uh, there's going to be kind of a... Uh, a trial run on about 30 citizens on on uh, a survey to kind of get a feel for what's going on making sure that some of the information that we're asking is what we really need to be asking or maybe some more stuff comes out of it that we need to put in there some of it will be a phone call uh, with a short message uh, most all of it will be mailed out uh, with a return address for them to to return it back um, some will be web-based uh, like but they're, they're, yeah, <laughs> uh, but the, through through what I what I understand through the contract is they're looking for about 300 returns on their their survey. So and they're going to not just take the survey of Shawnee and keep it within Shawnee. They're going to compare it nationally to to other surveys that they've done. So so that we're yeah. competitive nationally too. Any other questions? Okay, Chair, I'll entertain a motion in this matter. 
I'll make a motion to approve the acceptance of the proposal for the parks master plan by Schaefer, Klein, and Warren. I have a motion. Second. And a second by Vice Mayor. James Dope. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> motion carries. Okay. Item number 14, consider Oklahoma Municipal Retirement Fund lump sum payment from defined benefit plan and refund of contributions from the defined contribution plan for Stanley Howard. Staff report. This is just a routine item. This is an employee that is resigned. He is vested and he is not, um, he's just wanting his benefits due him from the OMRF, DB, and DC plan. Okay. Any questions? Okay, Chair will entertain a motion on this matter. Yes, second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Harris and a second by Keith. Mr. Winteringer, okay. John. John. John, okay. Smoke. <laughs> motion carries. Item number 15 acknowledge a sales tax <laughs> report. Mayor, Commissioners, Diane Smith with Finance Department. Your report should be somewhere around page 278. May sales tax collected this month was 1394971 Compared to last year's report, we are up 82262 For fiscal year, we're up, we're up 4.89% or 733965 in comparison to 2012 numbers, however, we are down by 57,787. Do you have any questions? Thank you very okay. much. It's good news. Okay. Uh, city Manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief. I know I'm one of the only people that's in between us and the, and the Thunder game. <laughs> <laughs> this time of year, it's always budget time. We've met with commissioners to talk about their individual needs. We've still not finished up the street budget. We've still got two pieces of information that we need to get for that. Uh, one was the Avitas grant that we just got that we want to make sure that we had matching money for, and the other is the South Kickapoo project that ODOT's studying with us. We should have numbers here in a couple of weeks before we adopt that budget, but uh, I wanted to let you guys know that we're working on getting those to you. Um, we already addressed the Kickapoo stamp concrete issue. Also, health insurance has been a big issue. We've worked with our consultant, uh, Dustin, with uh, Insurica. Uh, the, the insurance work group met and uh, the city commission met uh, in a special session, in a work session, and then at last meeting adopted an increase of employer contribution to the employees. And I can tell you that from my perspective, the employees really appreciate that. So from them, from me, and from them, thank you very much. It'll help me keep and attract uh, good employees given that, that large increase that we had and hopefully our experience will be better next year. Today, uh, myself and Mayor Maynard and the folks that were assembled together met to put together our new 501c6 for our Convention and Visitors Bureau dollars. We have now uh, got a set of, of bylaws, articles of, articles of incorporation uh, <clears throat> Finley and Cook's working on our federal tax ID, and we've got a 13-member new board that's agreed to serve. The only thing standing between us and getting that board kicked off is a meeting that everybody's schedule will accommodate, and our, our executive director, current executive director, Kinley Ferris, is working on that. We'll probably try to meet before the end of the month. The only thing that'll probably hold up the new board is the rodeo. You know, given the fact that's the largest event that we have all year, Kenny was pretty much out of pocket two weeks before that and a week after. So um, we, may, we may assemble this board and get started, but we may not really have a whole lot of work on the, the other side of it until the, the back side of the rodeo. But wanted to make sure I reported on that so the commission may Commission, you want to get copies of all that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Brian, where are they going to office out of? Currently, they're going to stay at the chamber offices. We had some brief discussion today about you know what what you know we pay in rent or whatever while we're still there again that'll be up to the new board when they get started but um you know i, I don't think there's an immediate want to make an immediate change and try and find a building right now we need to get the board on board and then we need to get the staff hired and then go from there is it just um kinley and one other or is there multiple right now it's just kinley she has she no, has not hired another position i think 
very wisely knowing that the new board was coming on. But uh, I did authorize her today to go ahead and get some part-time or full-time temporary help to, to get her <coughs> through the rodeo because typically they have three people that are doing it and she's got a media center that she has to staff and all the prep work for it. I mean, it's just, it's just a grueling week for the expo staff and the CBB staff. So <coughs> I told her to go ahead and get some temporary staff to help her out with that. Is there anything left for the commission to approve on that? Or we approved a 501c6, but right. is there anything left that we have to approve? I think we just need to keep you informed. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, you, know. you, guys, you guys are still going to have a contract that we will have yeah, with the new 501c6. And I'll be happy to get you the, the bylaws and the articles of incorporation. It just happened this afternoon. So yeah. the city attorney was going to make the edits to them that we had. And I don't even know that she's had a chance to do that yet. But we'll My commitment was Friday. Friday? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get you a copy of those. Next Friday. Okay. This we Friday followed this Bill week. Geist's recommendation, like to get a business person, get a restaurant person, get a. Okay. Get a, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, get that list to you. I <clears throat> uh, got a telephone call from the Kickapoo Tribe. They are writing an environmental grant, and that environmental grant will be in partnership with us. I agreed to it, even though you guys are going to have to agree to it later. I tentatively agreed to it. Basically, what it is is they'll have a grant where our 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 citizens can take their their hazardous waste. The kind of stuff that central disposal doesn't take in your trash container so batteries and and things like that and electronics so uh, i agreed tentatively to work on them with that they're going to write it once we get further down the road i'll bring it to the commission for nice us to, to have them working with us yeah. absolutely uh, mayor Maynard, myself commissioner ag uh, and uh the fire uh, police chief met with uh the west side neighborhood association last week they had issues regarding some crime that's in their area and we're working to try to address those. Quick update on, on Anglin PR. I sent a quick email out, and, and if the press wants this, I'll be happy to get that to them as well. But um, our video's complete, our website's complete, the movie theaters will start on the 23rd, and our video, our PEG channel will be going on, on uh, here very shortly. Postcards will show up in residents' email this week, or as residents' uh, mailboxes this week. Uh, the city clerk and I are talking about door hangers. And we've got some newspaper ads that are about to go up. I know it took a while for us to get to this point, but now we'll be getting some things out there that'll actually show the work that's been done. Finally, Glory Days. John Ayers is our volunteer on that project. He has raised the match that the city puts into that every year for this year's fireworks that'll be on the 21st, I believe. I'll give you more information as that comes down. But uh, if you haven't been to that event, please try to attend it this year. It's that's 28th. It's a 28th. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It is. It is. It's the week. It's a Saturday before Independence Day with the conflict we have with the rodeo. So, I certainly be happy to answer any questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll get it and get it back to commissioners. And that questions? concludes my report. Okay. Is, is Glory Days free to yep. everybody? Free yes, to everybody. Sir. It's unbelievable. I mean, and this year it's going to be so much bigger. <clears throat> And it was the previous year. We had people stand in line we, last year for like an hour to just get food. Now we got three food people. We've got, I mean, it, it is, if you know anybody. Five don't purchase hamburgers. The hamburgers so. uh, he won't even give us a coupon. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we have happy hour. Oh. Happy hour. <laughs> okay, no more questions of him? Okay, we'll move to item number 17. Consider bids on the sidewalk ADA handicap ramp project and a rehab concrete streets project. Mr. Crowick. I'm gonna go ahead and hand these out. Now, at the last commission meeting, he had a substitute, didn't he? Yeah, he's a thunder fan. Uh, he's not a thunder fan. <laughs> oh, he's a thunder fan. Yeah, well, well you so pull a rank on him or what? Huh? Yeah, I Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, right. Tonight? One bid. That's a lot of money, man. That's only one bid. We have to have some streets. King bid. Yikes. Yeah. Okay. The uh, first item was consider award for our ADA sidewalk ramps project. Uh, we opened bids at the meeting last time, and Adam tabulated on page. Uh, 285 is the tabulation. We received two bids. The lowest and best bid was from Parathon Construction in the amount of $237,350. They're the contractor that did our Safe Routes to School sidewalk on North Union. They worked really well and 
expeditiously and completed it in time. I read uh, construct. I didn't want the job the or what they did. did you see? Well, no, I guess not. They, uh, <laughs> but the uh, uh, Parathon, uh, their bid is 12200 uh, or 12350 more than what we got budgeted, but I'm positive that we can find some that, that difference to make it up in our fund balance. When Cindy gets back, we'll have her go over it, and then at the next meeting, uh, we'll have a, uh, a budget amendment to supplement right. that account. But having said all that, uh, staff would recommend uh, Parathon construction for our ADA uh, sidewalk ramps project in the amount of $237,350. So I second. Motion by Commissioner Harris, second by Commissioner Hall on the vote on that matter. Motion carries. <coughs> Next item. B. Do we just gonna talk about that at all? Or? Oh, okay. Wait for you to read it. I don't know. Oh, it says <laughs> rehab concrete streets yeah. project. <laughs> the next item is a bid opening. Uh, we only received one one bid. Uh, passed it out to, uh, from Gee. MTZ Construction Inc. in the amount of five hundred sixty-eight thousand two hundred fifty dollars. And we'd ask that this item be deferred uh, until the next meeting. We'll come back with a recommendation. On the, I actually I want to really check this bid out compared to the bid we've received at the last project last year to see where that falls. If it's less than we may go ahead and recommend the award. Uh, usually when I only get one bidder, I'd recommend to oh, rebid, but. How much was budgeted for uh, $500,000 for it. Okay. But this is a maintenance project quantities wise. We can, we can reduce the quantities mm -hmm. to get within our budget. It's not. It's we'd recommend no, to defer it. Second. Back. Commissioner. <laughs> Vice Mayor Herod and second by Commissioner Winteringer. Let's vote. We're waiting on you. Okay. Any new business? No new business. No new business. Okay. I will adjourn the Shawnee Commission meeting and we'll move to the Shawnee Airport Authority. Uh, we do have a quorum, so I'll consider approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Commissioner. Second. All. And that's second by Commissioner Smith. Man, have you looked over this? Lease agreement. And yes, everything. sir. Okay. okay. Motion carries. Any new business? No new business. Okay, then I will adjourn the airport authority and I will call, move on to the Shawnee Municipal Authority. Mm -hmm. Having a quorum, I will consider approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Vice Mayor Harry. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. We'll vote. Motion carries. Item number two, delivery of wastewater treatment, volume three, with presentation by Smith, Roberts, and Balswalder. Call on Mr. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to go to the ball right? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Commission. Good evening. Um, what I've placed before you, there's, there's three documents. Um, the first one per your request on, is an executive summary for chapter five for the water treatment. Um, the second one would be an executive summary. Well, the first one is an executive summary for chapter two. Second one is for chapter five. And then you have the utility master plan wastewater treatment CIP. And this is actually, there's a misprint. This is actually volume number three. Um, just, just a, Draw a line through two and write three. Huh? Draw a line through two and put three. Um, we have a short presentation um, from Mr. John Rearing from Corallo Engineering. Um, Tom, Tom Crowley that usually speaks for them was not able to make it tonight. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and give the podium over to uh, John and uh, he will go over the presentation and the findings that they have uh, down. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. Appreciate the opportunity to brief you on the wastewater improvements. Um, again, I'm John Rearing with Corolla Engineers, working with Smith Roberts, Baldishweiler. Max Baldishweiler is also here uh, on behalf of the project for this evening. Um, I do have uh, a brief presentation. I'm going to very briefly go through 
Um, the materials that are uh, summarized in that executive summary um, provide you an overview of the improvements that are uh, recommended at both uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, start with a, a look at the capacity relative to projected demands though. You can see in the green bars there, that's the north side plant uh, and the projected flows at the north side plant over time. You can see that those grow over time. Uh, in contrast, the south side plant and its service area, uh, those flows are relatively constant. If we compare that to the actual capacity rating, um, you can see that at the south side plant, um, we have sufficient capacity. Um, however, at the north side plant, um, we're right now sort of on the edge of being able to provide the needed capacity for the flows today, and that problem will uh, worsen over time. This is an aerial view that shows all the different components of the south side plant, and rather go, than go through those in any kind of detail, um, I just want to point out that there are many different components here that are um, aging infrastructure um, that have essentially reached their useful design life. And this goes both to the equipment as well as the structures themselves at the facility. Um, much of the facility was built uh, in the 1950s and then added to over time. Um, there are some newer components as well. But in particular, um, there are components that are aging now and, and need a more immediate attention. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now the permit limits as far as the water quality requirements for discharge to the North Canadian River are really then what drive the need for improvements at the south side plan. Again, it's not capacity so much, rather it's maintaining that aging infrastructure uh, and keeping it operating. But we also have some permit issues that are potentially out there as well. Um, the Department of Environmental Quality or DEQ has increased the frequency with which we have to do wet testing. That's whole effluent toxicity testing. That's essentially an empirical measure of how well that, that effluent when it's discharged, uh, how amenable that is to aquatic life in the receiving stream in the North Canadian River. And so they've increased the, the frequency that we have to do that testing with. We have reason to believe that we'll continue to be successful with that testing. And if so, then we don't anticipate any major changes in the permit requirements uh, in the coming years. However, if they were not successful there, then it's likely that we would have new requirements uh, for water quality for ammonia which would then drive um, some more significant improvements at the plant. Now, we looked at three different ways uh, of handling this issue with the aging infrastructure at the south side plant. Um, three pretty distinct ways of doing that. One was simply uh, uh, abandoning the plant in place, essentially, uh, turning it into a pump station and pumping all of that flow through a new 16-inch force main all the way up. It's about 15 miles up to the north side plant for treatment up there. Um, that, of course, comes with a, a big cost, not only for the pumping and the pipeline, but we also then have to have the capacity to treat those flows at the north side that previously would have been treated at the south side plant. So that's one alternative. Second alternative we looked at was to expand the south side plant to meet potential new permit conditions. And uh, down the road, we can anticipate that there may be some nutrient limits on the plant. Um, even if we were successful with the whole effluent toxicity testing in the meantime, um, but having to do with nutrients, that's nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, both for algae and growth in the, the receiving water itself, also for nitrate and potential drinking water uses downstream. If we did that, and if we upgraded the plant right now, this is what we would do um, in terms of turning it, essentially modernizing the process um, and replacing most of the plant in place or just to the east of the existing site um, with new facilities that would be capable of meeting those new nutrient limits. The third alternative that we looked at was essentially to maintain the south side plant in place, um, not only get it back to where it's more robust and reliable, um, but so that it's able to uh, continue to provide that service uh, on into the future. Now the improvements with those um, come at uh, significant costs, no doubt. Um, I mentioned the first alternative, this is pumping everything up to the north side plant. Um, you can see that that's the most expensive uh, uh, option here. Um, we would have costs both at the south side plant with pumping it up, as well as costs for treatment at the north side plant. Uh, in contrast, uh, the south side treatment alternative to those full nutrient standards for discharge, uh, essentially replacing the plant in place, um, is also come with, comes with significant costs. All those costs would be at the south, not at the north, of course, because we wouldn't be making any uh, flows go up to the north. Uh, and then the third, maintaining the existing, is the least expensive of those alternatives, although still with a significant cost. So we have essentially some decisions to make, and this is a decision flowchart that I'll walk you through briefly. But essentially, it, it first hinges on the upper right corner there with the, the south side plant 
implementing what we're calling phase zero improvements. These are recommended uh, regardless of which of those paths we end up taking. And we've got recommendations for which path to take. But regardless of which path we take, there are some immediate needs that we believe ought to be uh, implemented um, that would be consistent with any of those three. If then we end up having ammonia limits at the, at the south side plant, if we're unsuccessful in meeting those whole effluent toxicity or that wet testing, uh, t testing uh, requirements, um, then we'd have an, a, a choice to make there. Uh, if they're not enforced, of course, then we would just continue operation at the south side plant uh, as currently planned. If those did come into effect, then we'd have a decision about the centralized treatment plant, whether we pump everything up to the north or uh, maintain treatment capacity down at the south. And if we did that, um, the two options would be uh, for a centralized, if we, if we did pull the trigger on the centralized and go ahead and pump everything up to the north, um, we'd have to do that pumping. We'd do a facility plan to look at exactly what the requirements would be then for that new permit um, and more details as we've moved into preliminary engineering and ultimately design and construct um, that pump station, the force main, and ultimately the improvements or the additional capacity at the north. If we stayed with the two plant model um, under that scenario, then we would have to upgrade the south side plant uh, facilities with a similar process. Focusing though in on maintaining the existing, um, the costs that we're recommending for the improvements here, um, first start with uh, what we're calling phase zero. We can phase these improvements so in recognizing the significant capital that's involved and so we can phase them in over time, first taking care of the most immediate needs. And you can see what we've got uh, here is um, some improvements to the uh, starting, let's see if I've got a laser here. Right. Starting with the lower right there, um, the wet weather pumps um, for the raw sewage, pumping it into the plant. Um, and then we've got in the purple there, you can see the primary and secondary digesters, which are currently out of service. And we would need to, to add some capacity um, and, and improve those. Um, but really, there's some very basic things that we would start with first. One is a new headworks facility. The aging uh, equipment there um, re requires replacement for continued reliable operation. Um, it also, uh, right now, is n not effective in uh, performing its role. What was that now? The, the headworks. So the headworks facility is the part that removes the trash, debris, uh, all kinds of things that get into the sewer, as well as things like grit, so it essentially prepares the wastewater for um, its more advanced treatment in the following steps. We also would recommend rehabilitating the digesters uh, and the fats, oils, and grease, that's fog facility. Um, that's to continue its reliable operation. Um, digesters essentially help uh, treat the, the residual materials from the treatment process um, and preparing them for uh, ultimately for disposal. And then lastly, there are various rehabilitation costs uh, that we recommend. And again, this is with that aging infrastructure, largely with the structures first, uh, the drain structure and repairs for cracks at leaks and leaks at the settling tanks and other facilities uh, throughout uh, the plant site. Uh, then rehabilitating the influent and sludge pump uh, facilities, uh, re the clarifier, weir brushes and, and covers. Um, right now there's algae growth on there, so that would be to help uh, maintain that algae free and maintain the treatment. Uh, and then last on the trickling fil filter facilities, um, the rotating arms on those are a high wear item and so um, those need to be replaced periodically and those again have reached the end of their design life. Switching gears now and talking about the north side plant, um, this is uh, again if you look at the green bars here, a projection of the flows going over time, increasing over time, uh, out projected out to 2032. And we need to find ways then of meeting that capacity need. So it's a little bit different problem at the north side than it is at the south. Uh, what is, was that projection based on projected population growth or, you know? It is. It is essentially uh, population growth in the service area, so in the flow area that's tributary to the north plant. And again, is it independence north goes to the north plant? What is it? Where's the, the break line for that? I'm not, I'm not certain. Steve MacArthur. Know? MacArthur. MacArthur. MacArthur North. Okay. That was all to the north plant. What did you project the population growth to be? Uh, it is in your, uh, in your executive summary there. Um, there's a table towards the back. I don't have a slide on that, but I do have the numbers in here for you. 
Uh, I believe, yeah, in the north side, so it's table ES4, it's on page ES18, uh, growing from a population of 15,289 in 2012 up to 23,528 in 2032. What, what page was that on? Uh, it's on page ES18. So page 18 of the executive summary. No, that's population. Yeah, and so it's based on standard planning factors in terms of uh, production per capita, essentially, uh, multiplying that out. We also take into account um, not just the, the average flow rate, but also peaking as well. And that's where we size the, the peak holding facilities as well, um, so that we don't have to treat that peak flow all the way through the treatment plant process. We can downsize the rest of the treatment plant, essentially, uh, for a, a, a moderated flow. So looking at the phase one improvements, this is essentially to get us to the capacity that would, you can see it's sort of stair steps there, gets us enough capacity to get us through at least 2017 and a little bit beyond. The phase one facilities that we recommend uh, include a number of different things. One is a peak flow holding basin, as I just described. Um, the current peak flow holding basin is very, very small uh, and undersized even for today's uh, utilization. Um, this again helps us so that we can not size the rest of the facility as large and we can dampen those flows as they come into the plant. And we also have modifications to the existing blowers, adding blowers there, um, modifications to the existing aeration basins by adding some additional uh, uh, aeration devices or diffusers in those basins, um, a new headworks and septage receiving facility. The septage receiving at the south side plant is something that we're recommending we move and transfer all of that septage receiving uh, uh, activity to the north plant. Um, there is a risk that if we continue to take septage at the south side plant, that that could trigger those am ammonia limits. And if we do that, that in turn triggers all kinds of other improvements at the south. Are the, the north plant is much more uh, uh, capable of handling the septage, septage. Are the ammonia limits existing limits or are they proposed limits? It, neither at the moment. And so what we're trying to do is make sure we don't end up with ammonia limits at the south side plant, which would be so very challenging. Seat, but, but what I'm saying is, you, you said earlier that the, the ammonia and some of the new, there may be new uh, on the nutrients, new threshold limits. Yeah, but new. we anticipate that that's far, far down the road, 20, 30 years down okay, the road. That's it's, what I thought. Yeah. But you're talking about potentially but, exceeding existing current limits. Right. Let me, so let me clarify. At the south side plant, if we continue to take septage at the south side plant rather than transfer it all up to the north side plant, there, there is the potential that that could um, uh, essentially increase the ammonia, which would cause us to fail that wet testing, which would then trigger ammonia limits in the south side permit, which is something we're trying to avoid. Because that would, that would then, it wouldn't just be aging infrastructure, but it'd be significant process improvements that we'd have to make in the near term. So the recommendation here is to improve the septage receiving facilities and add a new headworks at the north side plant. Um, all towards that goal of also maintaining the, the current permit conditions at the south side plant. We also have a recommendation for a third final clarifier uh, to increase the capacity there, uh, a new uh, return activated sludge and waste activated sludge pump station, uh, and then lastly, uh, an effluent flume uh, for the disinfection bypass so that we can measure the flows at times when uh, we don't have enough capacity in the disinfection system. I have a quick question. You know, the, the whole country is talking about reuse. Yes, sir. And Norman is going to pump their water instead of putting it in the river. And I heard you start out about saying new rules, how the water is going to have to be affected if it goes in, you know, controls will have to be upgraded and all that that's going in the river. Uh, Edmund is pumping theirs to Arcadia Lake. They're working on that project instead of putting anything in the river. Uh, does that change and you don't have to spend as much money if you use reuse? Yeah, so it's the, the answer is that it depends significantly on what you put that, uh, that water to beneficial use for. Um, so Norman and Edmund are both exploring, right. augmenting their lakes, um, although they're not currently doing it, right. um, nor do they have the regulatory approval to do that just yet. But that is um, part of their planning uh, for both communities, um, to take the, the treated wastewater, um, add some more advanced treatments so that it is uh, more suitable for potable use, uh, and then augmenting their lakes and taking that back to, to increase the yield out of the lake, essentially. So that's one way of using that beneficially. So or when you reuse. put it back in a lake, what I'm asking is, is the quality of water 
as strict as it is going into the river? Yeah, in those two, in those two situations, both of those lakes, Arcadia and Thunderbird, are both designated as sensitive water supplies, which means that you have to maintain the existing water quality or improve the water quality in that okay. receiving water. And that so in that case, it's very, very stringent. Okay. In fact, it's not fully defined exactly what they would measure and how they would comply with that. And so that's the, the regulatory hurdle that they're trying to okay. work through. I, I just wondered if there was a savings, if there was a way to put it back in the light. But what I'm hearing from you is. Probably not. Now, probably the, not. but what you do consider in that case is the, the offset of having to go to get a new um, diversion from a right. new water supply source. Right. Um, which in many cases can be very far away. So that's the trade-off that you work there. Is there, is there many using that wastewater from manufacturing and so forth? It, in terms of the, the end Not customer water, for yeah. the recycled water? Yeah. Yeah. So there's different uses. One is augmenting your potable supply, um, which is great because it's sort of year-round and so you can fully utilize that resource. Another, if you have industrial customers that don't need potable quality water, that's another good avenue. Uh, many communities use recycled water for irrigation, um, which doesn't require as high a level of water quality, um, but unfortunately that's more of a seasonal use, and so you've got an un underutilized resource in the wintertime. But on the manufacturing end of it, we've talked to some of the plants, and they would be happy to get uh, the water from them uh, to save them money rather than have processed water. They could just be the cost of it. And so that may be a viable option. Here. Yeah. You got to do, you gotta do the business case. You got to do the math on it to make sure that you can yeah. clean it to the quality that they would still require. Plus, you got to run the line over there. Right? Yeah. And and there are um, water quality requirements from DEQ for that as well. Um, just last year, they passed new um, uh, for non-potable reuse uh, new standards and requirements for for that. And then again, that depends on exactly what you're going to use it for. Okay. But I didn't mean to get you signed. No, no, that's that's right. That's a good we're question. About a lot of dollars here. A absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and again, part of our strategy then is to phase that and tackle the most critical things up front um, rather than take it all in one, one big bite. Uh, moving to then second phase here, our goal here would be then to stair step it and get us another five years worth of capacity at the plant as well as meeting the affluent requirements. And the phase two facilities, um, the major feature here is that we'd be adding new aeration basin capacity. This is where the majority of the secondary treatment uh, takes. Uh, takes place. You can see that in the rectangular bars there uh, towards the left side of the screen. And we also would be adding uh, a, a new final clarifier, number four. You see that uh, paired up with the final clarifier, number three, that we added in the previous phase, uh, and a new blower building that would provide that uh, the blower, the aeration capacity for those no new aeration basins. Last phase then would take us out into 2032. In this case, um, at least for purposes of conservative planning, uh, we are planning not only for that capacity, but also to begin to be able to do the biological nutrient removal, or BNR, you'll see that referred to in your ex executive summary. In this case, we would modify the three aeration basins that we added in the previous phase by adding a selector zone up front. We also would add a new fourth aeration basin for that capacity um, as that flow, as you saw the stair step in the flow go up. A uh, new mixed liquor recycle pump station, this is to bring um, the, the essentially the mixed liquor is the material that's in those aeration basins. Recycle some of that back to the front of the plant. Um, that's uh, part of what you need to do if you want to get that biological nutrient removal. Uh, and then also a new sludge handling facility. Um, and I've neglected to mention new influent pumps for the capacity there uh, as well. So that would be the third phase. Again, that's out in the 2030 time frame, but um, so we can have our eye on that future. We wanted to give that, that perspective. So summarizing the cost then in those three phases, you can see it starts with about 22 million in the first 10 years, then increases a little bit for the second phase of improvements that I just described, and then you can see the cost for the third phase as well. So, so I hate to make you go back, but yeah, sure. for That's phase fine. one for the north plant, we still don't increase the capacity to, to what it exists today, what it needs, right? We would actually. We would, um, we would provide a, additional capacity Uh, partly through adding the peak flow holding basin. You can see it's, it's shown there at the scale, um, uh, at least approximate scale. Um, that's part of dampening those peak flows. Right now we don't have the ability to do that um, very well. We've got less than a quarter million gallons of, 
uh, of capacity there. So that's, that's part of the equation. Uh, but it's also making uh, modifications to the existing aeration basins. Um, when you think about the ability to treat a certain flow, it's one is hydraulic capacity. It's just can we physically move the water through the plant? The second is treatment capacity. Can we meet the discharge limits um, at that given flow rate? And so it's a combination of those things that we're doing here. So with that combination, we would be able to, to, to increase our capacity? Yes, yes. Really, everything up until phase three is about increasing capacity uh, until phase three when, you know, time will tell, but we're planning for the potential implementation of tighter uh, nutrient requirements uh, on the discharge from the facility out in phase three. So to summarize then in, you can see we've got them in buckets of years zero to five, years five to 10, 10 to 20 and 20 and beyond. That's out to the 2032 timeframe. Um, from the south side in the blue bars or green bars, the north side in the purple and adding them up as the total uh, in the red. So uh, at the beginning in the first immediate zero to five year phase, new headworks and digester improvements at the south side plant. At the north side plant, that holding basin we just described, <laughs> also a new headworks and septage receiving plant uh, facility. Again, that's to move all the septage receiving uh, so that all of that happens up at the north side plant rather than some at the south, some at the north. In the second phase, the years five to 10, um, primarily just rehabilitation projects at the south side wastewater treatment plant. Uh, in the north side, we would add those aeration basins, those rectangles that you saw on the slide, and a new third clarifier. In years 10 through 20, um, we would have additional capacity improvements at the north side plant, but uh, no improvements recommended at the south side plant. And then in the, the longer term future at the south side, um, we are planning for the potential for that biological nutrient removal. And so some of the capital, capital costs you see there uh, are largely driven by that uh, at the south side plant. Uh, but at the north side plant, um, we'd have capacity improvements as well as um, potential biological nutrient removal improvements there as well. What are the options if you don't have the 30 million over the next five years? Uh, I mean, really, what, what happens? Well, part of what, part of what happens at the south side plant is that, you know, we, we try our best to limp along by maintaining the equipment, but it becomes operationally very difficult. At the north side plant, um, it's a little different story because, again, that capacity is very quickly going to exceed our, our ability to treat to the permit limits. And so a likely scenario there would be that essentially we try and force too much wastewater through that north plant more than it can treat, either hydraulically and, and more likely on an actual treatment basis, and we don't meet our discharge permits, well, and do, so we get violations. Communities that don't have the funds and they have those plants like that, they restrict building. What do they do? Stop new you're, customers? You're, your options are fairly limited there. And so usually what communities do is they look for uh, low cost financing opportunities. Uh, I believe you've worked before with the Water Resources Board and DEQ on state revolving fund loans. Um, but that's essentially the path that, that many do. And ultimately then um, that comes through uh, repayments, through the revenues, through the rates. Right, but <laughs> Well, you're the bear of great good <laughs> and, and I'm standing between you and the Thunder game with wastewater. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> they better win after what you <laughs> laid on us. <laughs> <laughs> Ten to seven cents. Okay. We're right. I'd be happy to answer I would any say this. Questions. Thank you Ten so much. Seven. It's very informative. Uh, uh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, do you have any new business? No new business, but I have a quick administrative report I need to make that <clears throat> wasn't really thought about when the agenda was made. Very quickly, the Commission approved a contract with a company called CP3 to uh, dig the sludge out of our sludge ponds at the water treatment plant and then build a berm on the North Canadian River so that we can rebuild that other sludge pond. Well, they decided to take it upon themselves to take our dirt and put it someplace that Who's wasn't that? approved, CP3. So ODQ got a call and Hi. said, why are you putting dirt here? Unbeknownst to us, we didn't know it was going on. So I authorized some overtime over the weekend. Uh, we, had a, we had a deadline of Friday. I think we finished it up on Sunday. And we got it all removed and put to the place that was supposed to be put to. And we will be having discussions, the city attorney and myself and the utility director, 
on how we are compensated back for that. Fake but we saw we saw the issue with that dirt being put in a place that was in uh, Tecumseh's watershed as an issue. The EQ gave us a deadline, so we took care of it and removed it. We also had to hire a company out of Seminole to fix a, an old capped wellhead that was on the property that we didn't know that was there that CP3 put the put the dirt on top of. So we got that taken care they have of. Have a last, bond or anything? Last, CP3 on this job? So yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I, we, we are going to do our best to work it out with our contractor. But I wanted to let you guys know in case you heard something from somebody else that I authorized the overtime and we got it taken care of. And ODEQ is happy with it. I assume they were out there today, right, Steve? And um, and we'll be having discussions with CP3. Wow. Anything can't, else? Can't move dirt without getting approval. And we had an approved site, and they didn't take it to it. Okay, so that's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, okay. I mean, I'd like to thank the city staff that's here. I'd like to thank the reporting people that brought it up to speed and you commissioners for being here. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.